Welcome to another episode of the Rugby League Outsiders. My name's Craig. And my name's Carl. And uh, today we've got an amazing guest, uh, Kevin Rudd, who we're going to talk about uh, his history in Rugby League, which is absolutely so deep that it's just, I don't think, you know, the time we've got will allow us to even scratch the surface really, but it's going to be incredibly interesting. We might as well dive straight into it and just get a little bit of an intro from you, Kev, through life to this point right now, what's brought you here? <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with the school teacher, Mr. Smith. He's to blame. You know, Nine, <laughs> Nineland's Lane Junior School, Garforth. Uh, uh, what, what a start it was. But um, I just remember this big thug of a teacher coming on his motorbike, coming into the classroom and saying, now then, lads, is it cross country or rugby league? Well, none of us knew what rugby league was at the time then. And we just went, oh, I didn't fancy the, the weather in the cross country. So that was the start. So, uh, and I've still got friends from that time. So, um, and they'll smile if they, they hear this. So, um, Started there and then obviously went through the normal thing, community club, Garforth for the years. And then when they didn't have a, a, I think it was an under 15, 17s or something like that, they didn't have a team. So I went to the local community club in Castleford. People remember it, Red Hill. Uh, had a couple of glorious years there and then went through the cast system, academy reserves, all that type of stuff. And then dabbled around at a couple of pro clubs. Uh, went to university, we experienced the whole university stuff and then went on an absolute crazy journey uh, roundabout Scotland, Serbia, Netherlands, Germany, you name it for rugby league. So, uh, and now I'm a dad in the local area here, help out in the community game in London and then help with young lads on their starting journey towards professionalism in rugby league. So, um, it's been a it's been an adventure, that's for sure. Well, it's incredible even though because a lot of the things you're talking about there, like it's, it's at f the fledgling level, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like the, the, yeah. the times when you talk about Scotland Rugby League, yeah. uh, you know, it was when it was not even just emerging, like just get, literally getting started. So you, you experiencing all that must be incredible. I've been very fortunate and I was very fortunate to be guided by people in my early stages of being a player and then as a coach and then as an administrator when I worked professionally for the, the international game. Um, I had lots of good people around me, but then... I always wanted to s surround myself with good people too. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's on a voluntary level, semi-professional or professional. You want people to be good at what they do and, and enjoy what they're doing. So uh, I've, been, I've just been really lucky, I think. Um, and when you're right there at the beginning, um, and I've been fortunate to be at the birth of the sport oh, in at least a dozen different countries. And when I mean from the birth, somebody with an idea. They want to do something, they don't know, they've seen it for the first time, this is rugby league. Oh, I quite like the look of that, who, who can I contact? Well, I had five glorious years of my life when I was younger, um, where I'd be the point of contact, and I'd deal with my opposite number in Australia, who was the point of contact there. And you have to take someone on a journey from, are they serious? Uh, do they know what's required? Mm -hmm. And then trying to take them from that idea to forming a governing body, getting good people involved, setting up domestic competitions, setting up sponsorship, getting equipment to them, getting the rules, getting good advisors to support them. What a journey. And, and uh, it's nice to see, you know, all those these years later, some of them qualify for World Cups and things like that. So, yeah, it's been good. It's been an adventure. And equally, um, it's been nice recently, in the last few years, where I kind of came out of retirement. I had a few years out of the game, uh, that was for family reasons. My father became very unwell and uh, I needed my time with, with my family then. Um, and when I came back out, I started in the community game, right at base level again, almost, almost in a way to remind me of what it was like. And um, it's been an adventure, that as well. Just seeing everything that goes on, whether it's in the wheelchair game, the girls game, the schools, uh, uh, the primaries, the, it's just been... And there's a whole bunch of things there I've probably forgotten because, you know, the student game, the junior ju junior league around here, the men's community game around here. And you just go around and you're just some old bloke that turns up and uh, and you just try and encourage people from the different clubs and encourage your own as well. So, that's so yeah, that's probably a long answer for a short question, but no, I don't just... know where you want to take it after yeah. that. Uh, so, Kevin, let's, uh, let's start one of the first clubs you helped to set up. Was it 
Nottingham, was it? Oh, there you go. That's a that was a, an experience again. So, so t- tell me about <laughs> Nottingham and what went right and and what went wrong and oh. uh, and what you've what you've learned from from setting that club up. Well, I, I was there at the beginning. I wouldn't say I was the instigator or the, the main person, so I don't want to take... No, no, no. Okay. So I was just there at the time, and, and it was just one of those periods in history where I, I learned so much. Um, I'd, at what, the, what year was it, sorry? So this must have been about 19... It will be, the, the historians will be able, to, be able to date it from when Nottingham City came out of the professional ranks. So I think that must have been about 1990, 91, something like that. Yeah. Um, and it was just by chance, I, I'd, I'd gone down to start studying at, uh, at Nottingham, Trent, Polytechnic as it was then. Um, and I was out injured uh, for, for a period there and I was going through the Castleford system and I was fortunate to, to be coached by some of the great guys there. It was Dennis Hartley and oh, there was Mick Morgan, Daryl van der Velde and, that, and, and then got to play alongside some of the, you know, the, the cast royalty players mm-hmm. when I was a a junior, it was, it was fantastic. But but I went down there and then there was a, a, a fledgling Nottingham Trent Polytechnic side, or Trent Polytechnic as well as there, and Nottingham Uni were just starting out. And then there was this team, Nottingham City. And I, you know, turned a lot, you know, with I guess with the pedigree that I'd had, ended up playing there for a while. And uh, it was bizarre though, we, we were training in Leeds and then we were playing every other week in the Harvey Haddon Stadium in Nottingham. Those people that know Nottingham will smile at all that. Um, and it was just, it was the perfect things for how not to do it, really. You've got to get the local community engaged and involved, and it's got to be heartfelt from within, and you've got to get local people in management positions, coaching positions, all those things, so it's their sport, and they make it part of their community. If, you, if, you're, in a, if you're a minority sport in, in, in a new area, you need people from within that community to support you, and I guess that's what I learned there. And I guess that's what you look for, what it, what you started to look for if you were starting the sport, say, in Scotland or in Serbia or Italy or Netherlands or Germany or all these places. There are core ingredients that you're looking for in the people. They don't necessarily have to be geniuses about rugby league. Um, you'll normally find that there'll be some expat uh, northerner or Antipodean that does really know rugby league. But what you need is decent, honest, straight, kind people that, see the, the, the sport for what it is and make a decision that they want it as part of their lives and they take it forward with them. And that's when you really start to make a difference. So if you've had those experiences of where it didn't go right, so I went through the whole journey of Nottingham City being uh, taken out of the professional leagues and then just seeing what happened to the club afterwards. And then out of that came a lovely community club, Nottingham Outlaws. Um, and they're still functioning and there's still a lot of guys from that time that will remember all that. And now they have good links with, I think uh, it's now turned into a university, Nottingham Trent University and Nottingham University and then outlying universities around there. And they've got a nice model there. And uh, they've, got, they've got, I think they've got their own ground now and, and they've yeah. got bricks. It's part of the community, right? Yeah, yeah. And th- that, that's what you, where you've got to get to. You know, if we want the sport to be uh, the greatest sport in the world, which we all think it is, then you've got to get local people feeling that way too. And you've got to give them a voice and give them a chance and some direction. So, so I guess that's what I learned a lot from that situation in Nottingham all those years ago. I guess while while you're doing it, you're just a you know you're a young guy that is trying to make his way in, in life, and you didn't realise what was being put into you at the time. But it's only on reflection when you you get a little bit older and look back. So just fast forward slightly then. So what's brought you to to London now then? How have, have you ended up kind of down here? Well, I'd say. Uh, well, well, I, I've always been fortunate. I'm very passionate about two things, rugby league and engineering. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Um, I'm one of the highest qualified engineers for what I do in, my, in the country. And these days I do a lot of expert witness work, which is when everything goes horribly wrong, a fatal disaster or whatever it may be. And that's my day job these days. So quite serious stuff, some of it. And um, I... A lot of the businesses that I was working for and the people that I was working with at the time were based in London. And I moved down for my engineering life. Um, at the time, I, I was still working in rugby league uh, internationally, so I just needed to be near an airport. Uh, so it all worked. And then you put roots down, you have your own family, and you settle. And that's why I'm still here. And uh, still enjoy doing rugby league after 
So someone told me I, I've been coaching now. I'm into my fourth decade. Not quite, <laughs> which is a long time. And I say you're sporting the uh, Elmbridge Eagles shirt. Mm. Kevin, was you instrumental? Were you part of setting that club up? or Absolutely not. No. 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 So, it was, so, it's, so it is, um, it's a perfect example of, uh, you know, it was the nearest club. And when I came out, uh, as I said, a few years out after working professionally for years, um, and I just walked down to the local club and just went along and said nothing and just said, oh, I was interested in getting involved and maybe he's doing a bit of coaching. And then a few years later, you're, you're helping run the thing. And, and, and yeah. yeah, so the club there is, I think, a good example where the management board, so I'm just one of, uh, uh, of four on a management board uh, and deliberately so. Um, I think it doesn't always work if you have one strong character that has a lot of rugby league experience in them. And then there's three others on the management group, and and one is now he's he settled here and he's got uh, grown up children in their late teens, twenties. He's been here twenty odd years, so I think he's naturalised. He, he was a Huddersfield uh, Leeds fellow, and a, I think his father was a Huddersfield diehard fan. So uh, we won't hold that against him either. But, um, <laughs> and then and then we've got literally on the board um, one of the nicest stories that I never get tired of telling is. Uh, there's a lady there that's, the, I think, the most experienced child welfare officer in the region for rugby league. She's been doing it a long time. Very subtle stuff and very sensitive stuff sometimes when you have to deal with. Uh, we can talk about the, the club if you want, but there's lots of other clubs as well in London. So I always talk about that. And, and then we also have a, a guy that's ex-forces. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's in a wheelchair. Uh, and they're local families. They're parents, grandparents, they're local people. And they give a good moral compass to it to a club because they, it's not somebody that's coming that might move on and move away from it. This is their area, so yeah. they want they, they want to welcome people as if, okay, part of the family. Okay, you all play in the game and everyone wants to win, but no, you know, try and put some food on, try and make it a good experience. And then likewise, um, if people join the club, uh, uh, the, it's a family club. So we're very fortunate. I think it's technically the largest community club in London and it's also the oldest and this is the nicest thing so um, the first game pr uh, of professional rugby league in London was what any ideas fellas not did, a clue did, didn't um, Fulham play, play Wigan correct you've got it hang on yeah. oh, well done, and then Fulham won Fulham won I had a friend who played in the game right hang yeah. on so this this is the connection then so um the starting fullback, who's number one on the London Broncos heritage list of players, was a guy called John Risman, and his brother was Bev Risman, and obviously their father was a, a great guy. I was very fortunate to be mentored by Bev and then coached by John. John's still a friend to this day, uh, and uh, if his daughters hear, hear this as well, I'd say hi to them. Uh, lovely family and rugby league as you come. Um, but you know, so that, that's the connection. That's my connection back to the first London game, if you like. But the nicer one is one of the older coaches at, at the club who's been there, single club man. There was a kids' game beforehand, and he played in it. <laughs> so that's how long we go. But so when people come to Elmbury, we're rugby league people through and through. But we also respect all of the sports as well. So, uh, so there. Hopefully, that gives you a little insight into the in, into the club and right why I'm there. And uh, we've got some lovely things going on next week, which is probably related to... The yeah, show. yeah, t t yeah, tell us about it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so I should, I should yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I've been heavily involved in the university game and, and yeah, I got all kinds of service awards for service to student really a long time ago. And I was mentored by some of the start. Again, Bev Risman was the first student rugby league director a long time ago, 1980s. And then there was two of them in the beginning. The other one was Dr. Mal Reed, who was also the founder of Scotland Rugby League. And that was a big beginning of a journey for me to going on to being a director of rugby for Scotland, uh, helping set up the first club side in Scotland and all kinds of strange adventures. And then establishing international teams for the first time. So I got to play in a couple of student World Cups, which are glorious, and, and, and still got friendships from all over the world, whether it's uh, Japan, South Africa, and all these teams are playing against. But coming back to this, uh, you know, see, we we're actually we've got the first game. I'm very privileged. Um, the first time I experienced wheelchair rugby league was a, about 2008 when I was still working professionally in the game, international game. 
when a Frenchman called Robert Fasolet tried to encourage people to get involved from the RFL and the wider international community, he had a hell of a fight. But eventually he's persevered, and now what we see is on you know, these games on BBC too. Yeah. And, and so I remember turning up and, and giving out medals at, at some, after some the first internationals. Again, you, the historians can date it. It was at Brunel University, England versus France, around 2008, something like that. Nine, I don't know. I'm getting old and forgetful. But um, And ever since, I've always had a, a feeling for the sport um, because it's truly unique. It is truly unique. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's fifteen year olds with sixty year olds. It's able bodied, disabled, it's men, women and every gender possible in one team. And I think I don't think there's a more inclusive sport that you can do as a team sport together and a contact sport as well. So it, it derives something. And I'm very privileged because I help out a number of universities. Um I recently helped out with the South of England University side. So I got to coach uh, young men with the futures, in, really bright young men with the futures in front of them from you know, Oxford University, Cambridge University, Brighton University, Reading, Brun all these places, Brunel University, uh, Warwick University. Th th there's a whole bunch of them, Staffordshire. They were, they were all in there. Nottingham had a few lads in there as well. Loughborough uh, were strong. And um, anyway, but so I was involved with the student game and uh, I help out with St. Mary's, which has a long history in rugby league. And uh, we're hoping that St. Mary's can get a, a really strong partnership with Broncos going forward. Um, and they're also looking to get connections into the community game because there's such a lot of knowledge in there, just general sports knowledge. They're, they're doing it in degrees and some of the research they do is, is, is fantastic. But we've got our first wheelchair rugby league game instigated by St. Mary's. So they've got, their, uh, they've got a team. Uh, there's some inspirational characters that are, in, uh, are disabled. Um, and they founded this, and uh, we've got our first game next week, Tuesday. It's coincided with Elmbridge starting their first wheelchair team. So it will be the first, I believe, or I'm led to believe but by the powers that be that run wheelchair rugby league, that it's the first British university to play wheelchair rugby league in an official game. And it'll be the first game in our region, I believe, between two teams. So hats off. To, to all of them and, and the characters, uh, because, you know, I go along to, so I've been along to some of these sessions and, and the people involved, they're really quite inspirational people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just come away thinking, well, you know, not worthy, really, some of the things that I've, I've experienced already. So um, so it's a great game. Uh, uh, next Tuesday, uh, St. Mary's University, uh, the main campus, uh, is uh, first ever wheelchair, to six o'clock till seven o'clock. And uh, it promised it to be great. So that's why the shirt. That's why that shirt is. That's yeah. why the shirt. Uh, so just custom made. Um, and I'm, um, yeah, really pleased for them. The students have been marvellous. The men's uh, society at, uh, at, at St. Mary's, there's a bunch of them, a crop of them that have really dug in. They've had some tough times of late after COVID and everything. It's no different to other universities. But, uh, you know, they've really dug in to make this happen. So it's so a fair play to them. So that's the reason behind that. Super. Yeah. Um, just casting your mind back, when and, and just sort of think like what characteristics or what components of a of a new club, um, you know, if you see them, you think right, this is going somewhere or this has got legs. You, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, from that question, it will like, all right, are we doing that? And you know, does that mean we'll be successful? So I just wonder what what you think those are. Well, that was an interesting question. So it takes me back my first memory. I seem to remember being. And again, I was looked uh, for about five years of my life. I was fortunate to sit at the top table of the RFL, and uh, you'd talk about all the issues of the game. And there were some really intelligent, really good people, um, head of match officials, uh, Sir Stuart Cummings and Sir Richard Lewis. You know, they, these are quality people, quality characteristics. And, and I remember, uh, what does it take to get, start a national governing body? What does it actually take? Mm. What characteristics? And there were conversations and I would pick up ideas from lots of people. And and I think it comes down to, uh, you know, the basics. You know, if you're going to start a business, you know, local business near to you, you've got to have integrity. You've got to be decency. Say what you're going to do and do what you're going to say. Um, don't over, over promise and under deliver. You know, undersell and over deliver. All those simple things and, and characteristics, you know, qualities that you're looking for in people. You're looking for a passionate sport somebody passionate about sport, uh, but not, not necessarily um, rugby league. But it might be that they've just found themselves and their sport for the first time 
And uh, I've had those light bulb moments in lots of different countries. And then sometimes speaking through a translator, whether that's Ukraine rugby league, Italy rugby league, for example, or Serbia, um, where you know they found themselves. And uh, But what you've got to do is marry that up with that rugby league now and knowledge and experience and some advisors that have been through it a little bit. Um, and if you get that combination right, you see great things. So, you know, like you've seen what happened with Jamaica at the World Cup. You've oh. seen what uh, Italy going to World Cups and all the rest of it. And, and they get that balance of, of local people involved, bringing in people of ancestral players, everyone respecting what each part brings to the, the party, so to, so to speak, because you, you need it all and you, it's got to be in unison. And you're normally looking for a little dynamo at the heart of it all that it's the person that holds the door open, you know? It's the little detail. It's the person that cleans up the change room at the end. Mm. And then it's the same person that then goes and gives a speech to his international players. Have they got those characteristics and qualities? So if you've got something like that in the mix, you know you've got it right. So automatically I can think of the, the, the ones that are accredited with founding Czech Rugby League, for example, or Ukraine Rugby League. I can think of those characters. You knew exactly what they were. And uh, that's the kind of things that they displayed. So it's, and it's the same. If you're starting a club or you're starting a, a, a primary school or you're looking for a teacher that's, that's got those little, you know, and, and maybe there's a couple of parents at the school, a couple of, a, a senior teacher that says, yeah, we're open for it. Come on in. And no different to, a, you know, like a, a men's community game or a university starting for the first time or someone else starting, wheel, another university starting wheelchair at Billy. You look them in the whites and it. Do you really want to do this? That's the question and see where yeah. it goes. And, okay, t t tell me, uh, you've, there's so many we could delve into. Uh, uh, t tell me a story about one of the international governing bodies that you've helped set up then. Which one, would, which one stands out to you? I'll give you a choice. Czech Republic or Ukraine? Both. <laughs> <laughs> but Ukraine is very topical. So Yeah, you Ukraine. Know. We see a lot of Ukraine at the minute. So, yeah. Okay, so Ukraine Rugby League started with the first contact from a chap called Arta Matrosian. Arta Matrosian is still the president of Ukraine Rugby League. He started as a young man, and it must have been about 2005 or six. And I started receiving these emails. And, and by the way, this is only after a few years of emails being prominent. Before that, it was phone calls. And, right, yeah. right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and you, by the content of the emails, you knew this person was serious they were asking all kinds of sports science questions and they were asking all the right questions about setting up a governing body and when you've got something like that i had, I had, a, I had a lovely relationship with my boss at the time uh, again it was sir richard lewis um i've got one here and then i was allowed to get on a, on a plane went out there and i met arthur and his father uh, so if, if he listens to this, hello, Arthur, I hope you're well. Um, and his father sadly passed away, but his father had actually introduced American football into the Ukraine. Again, they can't make that stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I met various people, counsellors, and then we started on the journey. And I just knew from the beginning, and I wish them all the best out there because there were some serious people asking serious questions from the start. Got local council, the equivalent in the Ukraine involved, uh, and, and good people involved. So I, there's one example. You knew. You knew from minute one, and he's still there now. And he was committed, and he was prepared to make it part of his life. And he still loves it, I think. So it'd be nice to catch up with that. So. Uh, um, what, do you know where they're at with Ukraine rugby league? Obviously, we see a lot of Ukraine. Do you know how many yeah. divisions there is? How many sort of teams they've got? Obviously, they've got a national side. I think that, that I don't know exactly with everything that's gone on, but I think they got to the stage where they had a domestic competition and then probably a, a development competition underneath. Yeah. Just uh, And then I think they started getting the juniors playing. I got some lovely images of them playing snow rugby league, of all things. <laughs> yeah, it's just wonderful when you see it. It's just bizarre. So, uh, so there's, I mean, that's Ukraine. I mean, uh, Czech Republic's another wonderful one. You, you can't make it up. And um, it actually started from a friend of mine in Prague going to an antenatal class. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can't make it up. And... Um, Anyway, she got talking and said, well, she had this crazy uh, friend of hers uh, that went and did rugby league uh, in different places. Little did she know, she was talking to a Czech rugby union international who was married to a, an English woman. 
It was an international group uh, antenatal class. And all of a sudden, uh, I get this email again, and then some random call from somebody that he's coming to England at Christmas time. And I'm thinking, oh, I've got my own family stuff at Christmas. I've got anyway, we met at a hungry horse in some service station near Leicester. And um, so Midlands, again, you've got a lot to blame. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was the beginning. He was serious. And uh, he played for Czech uh, Rugby Union, I think about 30, 40 times. And he loved rugby league. He's a fervent Leicester Rugby Union. He, now, he still lives in the Midlands now. He's got grown up children here that I think they're all bilingual Czech English. Um, and he was the start. He was the founder. And then it, from there, we created a board which was a, a mixture of Czech nationals and then expats that, that had a love for rugby league. And that was the beginning, creation of the national governing body. We got them involved and we created competitions. Euroshield B and C, I think it was we called it. Uh, or was it the Euro Ball, I think we called it. And that gave people an entry point. And that's no different to a community competition. You need an entry, you know, merit league, a little bit, uh, and then, then you go a little bit higher and higher and higher. Um, and that was the beginning. So, yeah, uh, uh, an antenatal class in Prague. You can't make it up, can you? I think just listening to you, you've clearly got a belief in this sport. And, and I just wonder if you could put that belief kind of into words. Like, like, where does that belief come from? What do you, you know, what do you kind of hang your hang your hat on with that? It's an interesting I sometimes ask myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do, yeah. uh, I've been tested, that's for sure, and, um, over the years. But um, no, I think I'm grateful for what the sport gave me. And I'm grateful to the sport for the people that I've met that helped create some of the values that I have. I'm not perfect, never will be, nobody is, there's no such thing. But um, yeah, I think I, I do it because of the things that were put into me and I still enjoy it. And I still believe in the sport for what it can do at all levels. So, you know, I'm at a community club now where, you know, if, if and this evening there'll be two of the lads on show that, used to coach down there when they were like 13 year olds and um, they've gone on lovely journeys and they're, they're in the Bronco side. And, and and it's no different to lots of other of that team that's playing tonight. There's lots of others that started at other community clubs, which again, I respect and appreciate. So whether it's a Brentwood, an Invicta, a Brixton, uh, best make sure I try and say them all, Eastern, Hemel, uh, uh, London Scholars. Uh, uh, Crusaders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, okay. And, and, and everyone else. Uh, again, I don't mean to be rude. Uh, uh, there's... Um, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of them out there uh, that all do the hard yards. And then now and again, you get these crops of players that come through. We're very fortunate that um, we built up a, a good, sustainable club. We've got some tough yards coming because you've got to pass that button on. We're all getting older. Mm. And so we're trying to hard to bring in young coaches, young administrators, young volunteers. Uh, that are teaching us all about social media and all this stuff that, you know, when when I started, that there was no social, you know, there was no email, there was no no mobile phones. So, um, so um, but yeah, I still believe what the sport can teach people through life. And some of the things you learn in rugby league, you can take with you in your life. You know, you get knocked backwards, you get up again, and you've got to do it again and again. And then you can be put out of the game for a while and you've got to have the tenacity to, to want to get up and go again. And then, you know, you can't play again for whatever reason, but you can still get an enjoyment through it. Mm. And um, so, no, I, I think it's a wonderful team sport. And it's just, a, again, I'm going to go back to that same old teacher. I'd love to meet him if he's still alive somewhere. Steve Smith. There you go. Niners Lane Junior School. Cross country. I wonder if I wonder what if I had chosen hey, cross country running and all the lads with me. I wonder what what, what would have happened. Who knows? Just have one of those sliding doors moments where you could have gone a completely different. You know, trajectory in life. And Absolutely. I think we were just terrified at this big <laughs> thug. That he, he, honestly, all I've got these memories. He used to turn up to school on his motorbike, no helmet or anything, and then he'd come in in the classroom. Right, lads, we're doing this, and you, you didn't argue. He just did it, right? I think. But he was a rough giant. He was. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying it, he was a lovely man, and he was a he was a rough rough diamond, I guess. That sometimes you know, the world is a little bit sanitized now. Um, but he was the, the parents respected him, the kids respected him, the other teachers certainly respected him, and um, yeah, I'd love to meet him if he's still out there. I think uh, you know, I think everyone's got like that significant 
in our sport back in in those times, significant male, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of drove them to you know to play the game or enticed them into a game or whatever. And do you feel at times you've been that person for for individuals, including your own kids, perhaps? Surely you have, uh, whether you realise it or not. No, I'm not that good. <laughs> and I wouldn't just say it's male. I've had the pleasure of coaching girls rugby league uh, over the last few years, and then women's development a little bit and then supporting uh, women trying to become coaches for the first time. And honestly, it's night and day. They're, they're mm. going to be far better than I have ever been. You know, I've, I've seen a bunch already. And similar to some of the university players I've seen, if, if, if they've got the heart for it and stick to it, I've seen some bright minds there that will be far better than, uh, than I've ever done in mine. So, yeah. I don't, I don't know if you agree. Sorry, Carl, I've asked all the questions, but I'm just... Um, I'm fully in. I'm fully in. I know you are. All right. Uh, uh, I mean, Carl and I both agree. We kind of agree that the opportunities in the women's game are just incredible. Like the the rapid growth, you know, the way the game's developing, it's really exciting. Do you agree with that? And and if so, why? Um, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Society, it's a 50-50 split, uh, broadly, male, female. And I'm going to say again, and all the... Genders in yeah, between. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've I've got friends that have, have, have got different genders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or changed genders. So I try and I'm, I'm uneducated from where I, you know, on that world uh, from where I come from. So I make no apologies from that. But um, but no, I I think the potential is huge, and because I'll, I'll be, you know my house is controlled by my wife, my parental house was controlled by my mum. Mm. My grandparent was controlled by my grandmothers. Um, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's everyone's, but that was my own experiences. So strong women uh, coaching and be taking leadership roles in the sport, and it's not a problem for me. I think they offer a lot of insight and quite pragmatic and get things done. So, so yeah. Uh, the, the girls' rugby league, I mean, I'm going to say this, and uh, some of the boys and their parents might get across with me, but um, I've coached teenagers now in the local area for about, well, must be about 10 years, and, um, you know, play the ball and, and you know, catching how to pass, you know. Uh, there's a classic, you know, was it dirty fingers, clean palms, and hold the ball correctly, and, and all the different techniques of play the ball and tackle technique. Sometimes show the teenage boys, and then six weeks later, and I'm still, come on, lads, yeah. we, we need to do this. So some of the sessions I've had with the girls, you know, you show them once and then next week, what do we do on top of that? Then? We can do all this. So it's a different, I don't know, it's a different environment to coaching. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've just had a blast. Some of, the, some of the young girls that started when they were like 13, 14, and now seeing them as women, uh, and one of them actually plays for the London Broncos down there. She started down at the club as... 13. She's just got her England Rugby Union under 18s on us, as well as playing a full season for the Broncos, I mean. And we've got a few more of that quality coming through as well. And they just started as a group of girls coming down, throwing a ball around and then having a go. So I think women's rugby league and I think wheelchair rugby league, I think both of them are yeah. fantastic vehicles for the sport. And the, the one that I I still haven't seen what can I, you know, so when I worked in the sport years ago, still got these memories. I actually went to a robot football uh, event at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. And I think they then had a robot. It's took a turn, I didn't expect I'm not it saying, to take. There you go. So, and, they had, and then they had a robot rugby. So they were trying that 20 years ago. So I'm waiting for the first yeah. university rugby league robot. World robot. Cup. You heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. But, but, but I, I say in jest, but the science that comes yeah. from it and the engineering – and, you know, the, the skills and, and the engineering, you know, you think about what goes into the design of a, a wheelchair for wheelchair rugby league, the engineering behind that is exquisite and, and really quite quite pre, you know, precise. Mm. So if anybody watching at the minute uh, on YouTube <laughs> and you're involved in robot <laughs> mechanics or rugby league, please get in touch because that is <laughs> yeah. absolutely a story I want to continue yeah, with. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to completely change the direction again oh, a little bit. Right. right. Uh, I spoke to you off air. Um, I know you was involved. Well, at the time of recording, tonight is London Broncos versus Catalan Dragons. So this may go at a different time. Um, two clubs outside the Highlands. I know 
you've got connections with London, uh, which obviously you're based here. Um, but you was also involved with Catalan Dragons, weren't you? Um, you were the part of the team. Um, <laughs> tell tell us that story because it, it, it's it's a, a fascinating one. It was a again an incredible experience. I, I, I was included as part of a team, and then I was asked for opinions on different things. Uh, when they were looking to introduce Catalan Dragons into the Super League, and they, there was lots of intelligent, far more intelligent than me, and commercially more far far more intelligent marketing wise, um, all those skills, um, and had to assess the different applications from, and work with the French Federation. Uh, uh, rugby league in France it's, that's the, what they're called French Federation but that was easy oh <laughs> c'est facile huh? <laughs> but I, I always put my best uh, I don't try to put my best northern French accent <laughs> was, you know <laughs> je vous dresse <laughs> on sandwich jambon you know so it, and it always floored them every time that, but as, but that, as long that, that sounds like me in French class that does 100% oh, classic. <laughs> oh, my, my old French teacher Miss Boomer Miss Boomer I love you you are brilliant but um but you know, so we, we we had some fun with it, and um, anyway, we did. The, it was all to do with assessing a business, all the facets. So everything that's going on now with yeah. IMG, yeah. And then when I was a senior manager at the RFL, they went through licensing and and how to do it and what was included. And all. so it's a reiteration. It's, it's different processes, um, and and it, and it develops over time. And depending on the people involved and what they see and how insightful they are. They bring something different to the party. Um, I was very fortunate that I'd toured and played in France several times. Had a lot of uh, friends there, or people I consider friends. Um, so I remember coaching against Louis Bonnery, that I think still um, is commentating on the TV across there, and, a, and a, a lovely man. So when I was a younger guy coming through, he would spend time and just talk and talk about history of rugby league in France. And, and you know, it's a fantastically rich... There's so many golden threads that go back. So when I was a kid, um, the Harry Harry Jepsen. Mm. Uh, uh, so Kid Garforth is in between Leeds and Castleford. And uh, Harry Jepsen used to run the local schools competition. And I remember a story. I believe he received a medal from Jean Gallier, who was the founder of French Rugby League. All these lovely stories. And I believe he was a French teacher for many years in the Leeds area. Again, some people won't know Harry Jepsen better than me. But... Um, yeah, so uh, the whole experience, I like to think we got it right. There were some people that I'm not going to mention because I think they'd be embarrassed hmm. that thought, no, what's Catalan going to give to Super League? And as I think as we see in history has told us, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the loveliest places to go to enjoy Rugby League on a warm summer's evening and just enjoying everything if Rugby League's your thing. It's one of the best places to go. Yeah. And what can you remember about them when you was looking into them? Did they have... Did they have a, the junior structure right, the academy? Uh, well, it, it was still aspirational at the time, so it, but what they did have was, it was Trezist. Did they have the stadium at that point? Or? They had a kind of loose agreement with the council, I think. <laughs> 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 loose agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very French. <laughs> um, but you couldn't ignore the passion. Trez, anyone who's toured there knows that it's very political because of the histories of rugby league, and I'm not going to go into that. There's, oh, that's definitely uh, another episode. You know, that, that's a, Mike, Mike Ryland's written, <laughs> and, and Professor Tony Collins, lovely people, really uh, knowledgeable, learned men. Um, and but it was rugby league through and through down there. And when you take tours, you you know it. So you go down to the little villages, and then all of a sudden, the mums and dads are there. There's three generations, and I think that's where it comes from. So if you think about it, if, if France started in the 1930s. That had all those things where the sport was attempted to be snuffed out and then they fought yeah. like hell and then they kept going and going and going. So it builds this gnarliness, this stubbornness that says, no, we're going to play. And that's what they got. And that goes back to about 1930s. So if you fast forward to someone like, I don't know, Scotland Rugby League, which is kind of the official date, I think, is 1989. Um, but when the actual first national governing body got together, I would say it was about mid nineties. So it was this dabbling around of we got a university team and then some uh, community clubs, and then we we put a representative team out with all people that aren't living in Scotland and Do you know all these things. I, 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 just a little bit of history there. I, I actually got a letter from Scotland Rugby League. Go on. Yeah, myself. There was there was two lads, me and another guy called Alan Hendry. He's the guy that played in the Fulham game. Right. They were both serving Royal Marines in Scotland. 
and we both got letters. Come and play. I'd come and ask us to come and play, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, and I kept that letter for years. What, 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 vintage, what year was that? That would have been... 97, 98. I bet it was Graham Thompson's signature on it. There you go. Yeah. Go have a look on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I haven't got the letter now. I've oh, got the letter. I know, man, I know. You've lost the piece of history. You didn't play, though. No, but my, and then my best another friend, club on my best team friend, team played, you know, exactly. <laughs> he so, played for Scotland the year after Lee Milner, who's at um, Huddersfield Academy with us. There Second you go. Club. It's yeah. funny, all these strange. So no, so no. I, I, the first ever club side in Scotland, I, I had the pleasure of coaching Fourth and Clyde Nomads. You can't make it up. In the history, we lasted for about a year and a half, and then a, as a bunch of mates, we realised it was hard going going down to. For starting on a bus, you, you just get it right. For, <laughs> bus from Glasgow across to Edinburgh. They used to pick me up on the A1 where I lived, Dunbar. I was a, a, an engineering manager at the local cement work. And then we'd pass the nuclear power station and then we'd, we'd go down and we'd play in Newcastle or Durham and Tiger. In fact, hang on, I've got something really good. Do you want it? Yeah, yes, yeah, let's yeah. have a look. <laughs> I've brought with me my, my bag of stuff. This. Where do I show it? Is it there? This camera. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. This is the Nomads subs book. <laughs> Look at that. Right? Oh, there's about half a dozen lads that owe money. <laughs> I bet there is. So, but, so anyway, I digress. But um, So that was... that was. Where, 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 what did you ask me about? Where were we before? Uh, I don't, I don't know. We were talking about Catalan. And... Catalan. <laughs> so we've got... So, no, so Catalan. So no, you learned a lot about how to start a soup. You know, how to measure... So it's no different in my engineering life. I do what they call, you know, you've got a sense of it, expert witness, and then I've worked for big international banks, uh, the biggest in the world, so the IFC in Washington or Asian Development Bank in Manila. Um, and you, you do an assessment of a project or a business in a developing country. In, uh, and when we're talking, these are hundreds of millions in investments, so you've got to get it right. Um, and you're dealing with government monies. So uh, I guess it started with understanding how to assess a rugby club and then you go into okay well my engineer how do you assess it and you have lots of things pointers but the thing with rugby league the thing with France is they had that longer history so um, if you think of London now if the first people played in 1980 have we had three generations through yet just starting. Mm, just starting, third generation, yeah. Just yeah. starting. And, that, and, and, and they moved around London and, and then the community came and the junior league and there's different being academies, scholarships. It's starting to get that bit where it is but, and people are prepared to make it part of their local community. But you've got to encourage the local London families. So it can't be just a, a group of transient, you know, uh, uh, died in the wool from, you know, and I class myself as one of those. You know, I'm from... Rugby League Heartlands, but, but um, you've got to get local families that want to go, you know what, this minority sport, I like it, I love it, I'm prepared to take it on my life and go on a journey with it. And uh, whether it's that in Nottingham or Cambridge, Oxford, wherever it may be, Cornwall, until you get two or three generations, you don't start to see the full fruition, I would suggest. Because then as people get older, they get into positions of influence in council or, or authorities or, or, or businesses. And they go, you know what? I like that game. I respect it for the values of what it is. Mm. And I'm prepared to put my name to it. And I'm prepared to put my name to the administrators that get involved. Once you start to get that, then that's... And, and once you've seen all that, and then you've seen the journeys that these different international federations or regional federations where you set up and you get the governance right, and you learn from it. You also learn when you get it wrong. Um, and you've got to be you know, brave enough to say, well, I didn't quite get that one right. And be honest with yourself. And, and you know, you remember those decisions as well. Kevin, yeah, I'd just like to get your opinion on something that I, I think about quite a bit, you know, and it's very obvious in, in our sport. And it's that, it's that, that bureaucracy between rugby union and rugby league. And, mm. and, you know, you mentioned before how you tried to, you know, cast out rugby league in France. And, you know, I don't know if it's different reasons in Greece, but it was outlawed for a long time. Mm. You know, what is it that, why are we the, like the scene as the unwashed a little bit, you know? And... I'll go into that. So it's, it's all to do with uh, uh, governing bodies. So it, it started on a journey. It must have been about 2005, I think. We started the journey of rugby league being actually officially recognised as an international sport. Because up until then, 
Well, they, they didn't play it in armed forces. You know what I mean? It was like it's just all sorts. That's a different one. We can go, we can right, go okay. through the history of that. But <laughs> but the but the starting point was uh, an, an organisation. I think they're still called the same. Sorry, a little bit off the pace on that now. It's uh, GASE, uh, the General General Assembly of International Sports Federations, and rugby league um, finally became recognised a couple of years ago. So now when you try and start a federation in a country for the first time, so whether it be Ghana, Cameroon, or all these other yeah. places that have sprung up, and there's a, lovely, there's a lovely team of people that, all these people that are doing that are still out there. They are, I used to work with them all, uh, and, and they really are genuine people. Um, it's, it's hard. You know, if you're the first person in your country and you go to your local government official and you say, I want to start this sport, and they go, well, what is it? Is it in the Olympics? No. Is it in the Paralympics? No. Right. Well, what is it? So now it's part of case. It's recognized as a, a contributory international sport. And that's when you can now then have a conversation at government level. And that gives somebody something to aim at. Um, so that was a significant step. And it started about, as I say, it was a long journey and a lot of political wrangling. So, so to give you the specifics of certain countries, I've got to be careful. I probably get <laughs> disclosing all the, the, the trade secrets and, I think I, I think I must have signed some NDAs about yeah. everything that I dealt with, but um, but let's just not go there. Some of that because some of it was pretty difficult and so far removed from sport. Yeah, you know when ills of society turn up in sporting situations, then you have to deal with it, and that becomes a different level of seriousness too. So um, when you've got a, a government ministry or sports ministry in any country, and I'm not going to name the country. Um, there was, I think there was three different countries. I had to get MEPs involved from the UK to ask questions in European court because the players were being issued letters of being banned for amateur sport in their countries. And we got hold of the letters and then we had to take them to European Parliament and then the questions had to be asked in European Parliament. How can you allow this to happen in a developed European country? And then things start to change, and then people. But, but that's 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 what I don't understand. Is like what what drives that? Like okay. what is it that's so, so okay, bad so, about the sport? So I guess it's like anything. If if you're if you're in control of something, if you're a governing body, and I can see it from all sides because I've got friends who run governing bodies in in Rebune and cricket and all kinds of things. Um, if you've got a nice stable situation where you control the rugby, and somebody comes along and goes, well, you know, we're going to start, but we're going to be using some of your players. They're going to become protective, aren't they? Yeah. And and it's just human nature. Uh, if you get the right characters involved in the first governing body, it's easier. Um, and if you get the right motives about why they're doing it, uh, and that can delve into all kinds of reasons of aren't the right reasons for starting. Um, but if you there are these particular situations, some sport ministries made made decrees that there's only one rugby. And then you would have to get politicians involved to say, well, actually, it's a different code, different governing body. We're now a member of GACE, and you'd have to get political help. And I used to deal with British ambassadors in different countries who would help on, on things like that. And then the, similar, there was a network of Australian ambassadors that would get the message across. It'd be like saying um, ice hockey is the same as hockey. Table tennis is the same as tennis. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's so many, there's, there's real tennis and tennis yeah. and you know, there are so many different rules and associations that um, sometimes people become a little bit protective. And if the sports ministry doesn't really get that it's a separate, it's just rugby, right? Mm -hmm. Well, hang on, it's just rugby. It's just another version, you know, rugby sevens, rugby 50, rugby third. Yeah, it's just a version of rugby. And unless you've got the right people and the right mechanisms, um, it's very hard to get past that. In, in terms of Greece, I was actually at the first international in Greece, in Athens, a long ago, I think it was about 2006, Greece plays in Serbia. If the Serbian captain's still listening, you deserve to be sent off. Right? <laughs> okay, you deserved it. Is this the game that was, they couldn't advertise where the game was being played? No, that's is, long before that. Is that long before? Long before. So they had a whole political issue for years where, you, and it's, <laughs> rugby league is born out of the great schism of 1895, right? And what you find with these national federations, when, when they start up, sometimes you get a little bit of that going on, where someone will go, you know, it's a bit like the Spartacus moment. No, I'm Spartacus. Yeah. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm Scotland Rugby League. No, 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 I am. I'm, I'm Ireland Rugby League. No, no, I am. And uh, I'm Greece Rugby League. You're not. And <laughs> all this type of stuff. So 
I think it's part of its human nature and it's growing pains in the first few years. And that's normal uh, in my experiences of seeing them all, Norway, Sweden, all these others, Latvia, God knows how many. But, um, but, and each of them is very unique and different. And, um, but a lot stems to the people and the qualities of the people in the beginning and the advisors and the advice that they get. Yeah, back on. Yeah. Yeah, tears up on the shirts. And uh, where were we? <laughs> right, okay. Um, Kevin, couldn't let you leave without, you've brought a bag of what could only be described as rugby league history with you. Um, do you want to go through a couple of shirts in? Yeah, I've got to tell a story. Go on. See, my old mum is, is still alive. She's in her 80s and she's and she's actually lives in the house I was born in and, uh, up in Garford there. And, uh, she finally made me clear out my stuff. I'm a man in my 50s. And I had to <laughs> had this walk of shame and, and found all these old kids' books and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, there was this box of treasure. And I, I, I don't know why, I'd always left it there. And, uh, and it had all these old shirts in from things from the past. So just to, I guess it's just to, uh, you, you can't make some of these stories up, but you know, just to prove that you know I, I was there. And yeah, I've seen and have done. So I've got no particular order. I've, all I know is I've got it's lucky dip. Right, let's, let's, go, let's, for it. let's go, go for it. Lucky, lucky, dip. lucky dip shirt. Um, I'm going to go the easy one. I know, I know that one. Yeah, that's that's the Elmbridge wheelchair rugby league for next week. Classy shirt. What would you score that, Carl? That'd be a no, nine. That's a nine, 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 nine. It's a good shirt. Beautiful that is shirt. beautiful shirt. This one. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this is the first club side in Scotland. Fourth and Clyde nomads. What a bunch Fourth of and Clyde nomads. <laughs> what a bunch of rogues, thieves, and <laughs> yeah. just. I still remember. Vagabonds. I used to travel from. Uh, if you look on the map, Dunbar up to Bonus. I had an old Morris Minor, right? And uh, he used to take me about two hours to get to training. And I was the only qualified coach living, rugby league coach living in Scotland, right? And I used to go up and uh, I still remember turning up. We, we trained at Bonus, uh, Bonus Leisure Centre, because we had an 18 stone vegetarian that worked there. And um, anyway, we had about six turn up for trading, and I thought, wow, it's wonderful. That was the highest turnout for a while. Anyway, one, one guy said, well, we've got to go down to Newcastle. We've got a play. He said, don't worry, we'll get to about nine. I've got a mate who's a bongo player. <laughs> what we got here? And then another one said, and don't worry, my cousin's getting out of prison. He's, he's going to come and join us as well. <laughs> and that was, that was the, you couldn't make it up. And anyway, so from that, I had, I had a boxing florist. Um, <laughs> It's just bizarre characters. Anyway, and they all love rugby league, and I'm still in touch with some of them. And if any of them's out there, don't give me too much abuse. Don't yeah. tell them the truth. Anyway, <laughs> right, some, okay. some of them still are subs. We've, <laughs> yes, we've, we've established got the book, that. Yes, they still are subs. Here you go. Um, this is which, one which uh, has gone Cam by the wayside. Cambridge. This is Cambridge Eagles. But the reason why I show this is they were involved in uh, the London community game in like the late 80s. And it was right fledgling stuff. And it was before a lot of the clubs in London now that existed. And uh, they fell by the wayside. He was a typical nut that ran them, rugby league enthusiast. And I think he just drove himself crazy in the end with it. But, but yeah, so... It was, was, was he a northerner that had moved? Yes, he yeah. had. And he'd moved just off in the case. Yeah, yeah. And oh, here you go. Black and yellow again. Here we go. Look What's at this. Shirts that. This is uh, Bernard Hunter Cranes. I nearly lost my job over this, by the way. True story. Um, because I was getting sponsorship for rugby league living in Scotland, I think I got accused of uh, of giving work to a contractor or something like that, and someone tried to get me fired, right? And uh, so Edinburgh Eagles, and by the way, the bloke who's out there that tried to get me fired, if you're listening, I owe you. Right. Anyway, so <laughs> Edinburgh Eagles, first ever side, uh, jerseys, and I remember the first training session, we had seven players turn up. It was similar, and some of them are still involved with rugby league up there now, and uh, lovely, lovely people. Anyway. Edinburgh go. still still going strong, yeah. still going strong, in, in and, the, and, and developing a wheelchair game uh, team as well. Absolutely, yeah. and, and Ash Carroll up there, lovely guy, uh, the coach, and there's a whole bunch of them that are coach up there, lovely people, lovely people first, and but then we're hoping to do league. a Scotland trip, aren't we, this year, and uh, yeah. get up there and meet these people. So. Mm. And similarly, the, the other clubs that, that that do the hard yards up there, it's really hard yards to to for a minority sport up there, and there's a lot against you to make it happen. So you've got to have some gnarliness to to survive. Anyway, you lads are from the Midlands, aren't you? Yep. Right. Well, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it's kind, kind of. of. <laughs> kind of. So, this is going to make it. So, here we go. I don't think I can tell the story about this one on air, but um, 
There you go. This is not Nottingham Trent Polytechnic. Back from about eight. Look at the colour on that shirt. <laughs> Isn't it just wonderful? Look at the Look at, It's just quality. <laughs> it just you can see it anyway. So that outlast does that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and then and then around the same time. Create that one. Uh, they, they, they did the regional championships. So, so as I say, I went along for the, the regional championships, England. What's, what's this, it, what is that? So Mid 93 Midlands. Midlands. 93. So, yeah. So, um, I don't think I was ever a scrum half. So, I wonder God. when right. Midlands rebranded from white and red to blue and yellow then? I don't know. It got lost in the midst of time. But, 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 but again, it was lovely. So, the regional champ, go, to go, imagine going along 30 odd years later. I had a lovely couple of moments the other week at, at Sheffield Allen. The English University lads, and they all know I coached Scotland for years, right? So I'm getting a bit of stick anyway. And then I turned up with the South of England side with a Northern accent, so I get a bit more extra stick. <laughs> what, what are you doing with them? You know, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, 35 12, I think it was the drop goal in the last couple of minutes that just, you know, put salt in the wounds. Well done to the, the lads from the South. So, um, but it was great to revisit, and, and, and I had some lovely, wonderful moments. I actually ended up coaching a lad at um, Loughborough University. That you can't make it up. His grandfather was my coach at Redhill, and I never knew. And, he, and his grandfather, and I, and he, anyway, his, his grandfather turned up with his flat cap on, and he, he just took one look at me, and he just gave me the finger. That was it. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it up. Anyway, so yeah, and then this is another one. So just uh, this is Nottingham Outlaws. Nottingham Outlaws, eh? So Nottingham City. This was, I think, this was the leisure shirt that we used to wear. It wasn't the plain shirt, and um, yeah, it's the last. I think I've given everything away, so. So that's got, you know, so that's, that's the local stuff. So Nottingham Outlaws original colours were blue, navy and light blue. It's well, changed. You, you see what I mean? Uh, this, this one, here you go. You can't make it up. Uh, I was presented this from when we restarted Italy Rugby League. And th those people that don't know out there, Rugby League used to be there in the 1960s and it got squashed. It's a long story about how it was squashed and there's people that have done the research on it. But all I remember is as a, as a man... You know, just trying to do his job, trying to get a game on an international, the first international game. This old pensioner turned up and he was in tears. He was in tears because he played for Italy in the 1960s. Oh, wow. And he came up to me and he said, never thought I'd see this again. Never thought I'd see it again in my life. It was the most wonderful. Because Italy actually played Australia in a, in a game in Italy in the 1960s, or something like that. So there you go. So where are we going now? So Italian rugby league then, you know... I'm, I know there's a massive story here, but can you just touch on it really quickly? What sort was there any sort of domestic there when you you said you just went to set up an international side or? Um, so when uh, there was a guy called Tiziano Francini, and his brother was Simone, and um, Simone died unfortunately, um, and Tiziano just died about a year ago. Uh, they reinstigated it with a bunch of Aussie Italians. And again, the Aussie Italian guys, uh, Mick Pisano, if you're out there, lovely, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and between that passion of people with Italian ancestry in Australia and this local nucleus, mm. wow. And they created some wonderful things. And so we, I took touring teams over from Scotland and, um, and again from my time with the international game there and, and just had some great experiences. We, we stayed in Venice you, again what can I say on there? It, it was just brilliant. Yeah. It, they were welcomed and, and the young Scotsman that went on that tour, uh, one of the legendary ones was about tw 21 years ago and I took a t bus from Glasgow all the way to Belgrade <laughs> with 40 young men that wanted to play rugby league. And what an experience. We stopped off, I think, in Italy and the Netherlands and, and a lot, uh, this was before the International Federation and the RFL were interested. Um, it was kind of just giving a little, just yeah, kind of interested, and I went uh, and we we just went these daft Scotsmen, um, bagpipes, kilts, off we went, <laughs> and that was it. And um, so yeah, we played on these, and then and then slowly these these situations developed into forming national governing bodies in each of these countries. So uh, so yeah, all kinds of weird and wonder stuff. So I must have something Serbian. Serving. Yeah, yeah. So no, that was it. so all the players. So you know, again, when you help people out in the beginning, you get gifted lots of nice things. You know, so uh, that's an Italian one. Oh, here we go. We've already talked about the Ukraine, haven't we? Yeah. This is their first international jersey. There you go. It's quality. So yeah, there you go. You great shirt, that isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah really good shirt. I, I don't know what they're playing in now. Uh, oh, this is a good one. I always like this one. It just 
Yeah, a bit of Lebanon, Lebanon as well. Lebanon, yeah. yeah. Again, I was fortunate. I got invited out there. The current, I think, the current international general manager for rugby league, Danny Kazanjian, he, he worked with me for a number of years, and he was in, instrumental in setting up rugby league in Lebanon. And um, I went out there and coached a number of the universities, and it was just brilliant. Just again, lots of bright young people with the futures in front of them. They're going to be doctors, surgeons, God knows what else, and then they liked rugby league. And it was just great to be part of. So I don't know what else you. Lots of old, old Scotland yeah, ones. Say, that's a Scotland one. Scotland that's one. Yeah, that's an easy um, one. Uh, this one's an unusual. No, there you go. No, no, no. Why do I vaguely recognise that one? So this is no, a South Africa. South Africa, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So South Africa. Um, this is one of my favourite ones. Um, there you Looks go. very much like St. Helens, Japan. 1996. Japan. There you go. Japan. A bit of Japan. And, uh, and you was involved with Japan as well? Well, I still got friends across there um, through family. Uh, this was one of my favourite ones. Yeah, it, that, got... that looks like a rugby league outsider's kit <laughs> all over. That oh, Hurricanes. There you go. Yeah. What's Poland? No, oh, Russian. Russian? So I remember playing against Crikey. this big wow. dude from Russia, and I'm looking at the size of the shirt. I never filled that. <laughs> I don't know if I tackled him once during the game. I think I got my mates to do it. But yeah, all that kind of stuff. So uh, what else have we got? Oh, oh, yes. You were talking about Greece, so there you go. Uh, there's a track. I was gifted a Greece tracksuit when they first started out. So you can't make it up. And then, and then from my Serbian friends, what did I get here? I can't remember. It's Toyota. There you go. There you go. So you can't make it up. So I've got this. So I finally, and there's a couple more bags, and, and just, you know, you can imagine over the years. So I'm very lucky. We could do a full episode just on that. Okay, so uh, this hang on. Is... If I had to, if you had to pick one of those shirts which means the most to you, which one would you say? Oh, they all mean something. Or, or you wouldn't keep them, right? No, I've no. Give, I've, I've, most of my own international jerseys, but when I represented Scotland at different levels over the years, either as a captain or a coach or a player. Most of them I've given away. I've only, I think I've only got one left. So hang on. Yeah, I quite, I quite like this one. So I kept this one. And um, and the reason why I like it is it, it's kind of part of the issues that still face the game today. When you start a national federation, if you have a team representing you that doesn't have one player actually born in your country or living in your country. That's a bit, doesn't feel quite right. Mm. It's like a traveling circus, right? Yeah. So that shirt to me represents when the, they had a rule brought into our International Rugby League uh, called a domestic quota, um, where you had to have certain players. And they tried to come up with a legal definition of what domestic meant. It could be that they were born, um, they lived or they lived for a number of years, but there was an obvious attachment to the country that they're representing. Very difficult to do that. Not that whole thing about identity and somebody's identity. But if you don't have people based going back to if you don't have people based in the community, going back to Nottingham, for example, where there are people living and breathing and going out to schools and coaching in schools, doing jobs in everyday life, drinking at the local pub, going to the local supermarket, wearing their rugby league gear and being quite proud of it, and you've got nothing. It's just a circus, mm. and then it's just not real. It's a facade. Um, so that's what you got to work on. So there. So I guess that one. And uh, yeah, that's probably one that I can tell. Most. I can see a little glint in your eye with that one. Yeah. Well, that must have been. Is that like Jimmy Law's era? Is it or? It's probably around about that. Time yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah. So no, I was really you know so so I was very fortunate. I've been coached by all the original coaches of Scotland rugby league. So whether it was the national side or the students. Um, I think I've been coached by them all or coached alongside them all. And it was a part of my life that led to wonderful things. Now, through that, I, I got wonderful experience to go across to Australia and, and, and get some coach education across there. Although the, most of the juniors and the people I coach these days, they would think, well, what happened? You know, just <laughs> didn't you learn anything? And, but, um, but yeah, so it, just, yeah, uh, the whole Scotland living there, part of the community. As I say, I nearly lost my job through rugby league um you know trying to get people to sponsor things was pretty mm. difficult 
and uh, there were people that didn't want reboot. And a number of times, it, you got to, this is mid nineties, right? And, and I remember booking various facilities, turning up there, and then once uh, they found out it was rugby league, well, sorry lads, it's it's busy, and you've just got people travelling all over Scotland to turn up, and that affects your credibility. So we went through all those journeys, and then eventually you find places where you you feel comfortable, safe, welcomed, and uh, it gives you a start, right? So no different to this. Travelling up to Burness. Oh, come on, a journey. God, can you not? Anyway, there you go. Kevin, you talked a lot about privilege and luck. And uh, and I personally feel privileged to have listened to you today and to share the route, you know, and had a bit of a chat with you. And uh, you sharing your history and everything that you've done to drive this sport this sport forward, because we do love it. You know, we, we, we all love it. And um, without people like you, it just... It wouldn't be, you know, where it is, you know, you know, if it even existed at all in some places in the world. So, you know, thanks a lot from from me for that. Yeah, and uh, similar from me, Kevin. You've just spoken about a lot of inspirational characters that you've met along the way that have, like you said, cr driven the game forward. But I don't think without you at the helm of a, a lot of these places, we, we, you know, rugby league, really, like Craig said, probably wouldn't exist. Um, and I've really enjoyed speaking to you and literally going down a bit of a history lesson it's been fascinating and incredibly enjoyable so thank you for for coming on uh, well, well thank you for having me on and, and i guess my final message to people out there in the london community where i live now is keep going yeah whichever club you're at get your governance right get work together even when you don't agree get the governance right and it's and go on a journey and take the sport with you as part of your life and see where it takes you. Brilliant. What a place to finish. Thank you right. very much. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. That's the final whistle for this week's episode of the Rugby League Outsiders. We hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and share this podcast with your friends. And as always, if you have a story to tell, a club to plug or a player that deserves recognition, we want to hear from you. So until next time on the Rugby League Outsiders, take care.